We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level. You can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Neil, mate, thank you so much for doing this. I know you're probably expecting a big uh, introduction there, but um, it's a candid show. (laughs) Hi, Tom, mate. How are you? G'day. <laughs> now, you said you were from England, but uh, you've got that's a pretty prominent Australian accent there. <laughs> <laughs> I've been practicing. Funny enough, my daughter, age 12, does a really, really good Australian uh, teenager accent. Uh, she, she could be on EastEnders, our, one of our, uh, you know, pop soap uh, dramas. Uh, the accent <laughs> is so good. Oh yeah, no, I know East Enders. My um, my partner is um, is Scottish. Uh, Scottish. She's from Inverness, so um, I know all about the, the English sitcom. We we get a lot of them down in Australia as well. You know, we grew up watching um, all different sorts of things. So, like, and obviously one of the, none of them spring to mind right now, but I'm familiar. Well, I, met, um, I met Kylie once. She was on uh, Neighbours, wasn't she? Yeah, she was. She was in Neighbours. Yeah, absolutely. When yeah. I was when I was just starting to get. You know, the memories that I have now as a child is about seven, I think, when um, her song Spinning Around came out in those hot pants and all that kind of stuff. And obviously that made an impression on me as a young, as a young kid. She's great. Yeah, no, yeah. She's, she's a star. Yeah. What was she like? She called to me? Um, yeah. I mean, I obviously didn't have much time to chat to her. I was actually a security guard at an Elton John uh, party. And um, oh, right. she, she sort of um, nodded and winked in my direction. That was about it, really. But, uh, yeah, I, I'd like to say I met her. Yeah, absolutely. It's, actually, it's a bit of a lie. I was I, I just uh, an acquaintance, a brief <laughs> acquaintance. <laughs> <laughs> Your eyes had a brief encounter, and that was about it. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's enough yeah. to, to post on Facebook about Matt. I certainly would have done that. Well, so. I mean, you know, you can never believe everything you read in the papers, can you? <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, Neil, just for um, for people who perhaps don't know your story, could you give us a brief introduction of, of who you are and kind of the, the life experience that uh, that you've had? Because um, you've probably managed to fit more into your life so far than most people will across 10 lifetimes. So, so go, go for it. That's very kind, Tom. Um, look, uh, I am Mr. Ordinary Bloke who um, just doesn't give up very easily. I think that's the best description. Um, m- most ordinary uh, up- upbringing in, in the UK. Um, I struggled at school, if I'm honest. Uh, you know, I wasn't particularly a- academic. In fact, somewhere in the attic is a, is a school report when I was 12, which said, Neil is trying very hard but achieving very little. Uh, <laughs> so I, condescending. I, I, yeah, but that's the old days, you know, seventies, yeah. and um, you know, used to, you know, used to get into trouble quite a lot, and um, my backside still shows the scars. But um, so I struggled at school, but what saved me was really uh, having a vision, um, wanting to get out into the big bad world as soon as possible, uh, avoiding any more exams, and uh, just getting stuck in and having fun and uh, and rising to a challenge, mm. uh, and so. Um, I, uh, you know, having been cast, um, you know, aside a little bit by teachers, headmasters, saying that I'd never pass an exam, I'd never make it good. Um, I, I persevered, managed to get into um, the Royal Marines, a military organisation, and uh, served for a couple of years and then transferred to Special Forces, did some time with them, and uh, that, was, that was great. And that was kind of the thing that drove me from an early age, uh, that experience and then that led to uh, a business career which didn't start off uh, particularly well as an employee um, but then decided that the best course of action would be to set up and start my own company uh, grew that over a number of years that got sold to uh, a large FTSE 100 blue chip organization put a bit of money in the bank uh, and then for the last 10 or 11 years really I've been able uh, as a result of that to follow my own uh, passions uh, which are travel sport and adventure um, organizing leading expeditions uh, around the world um, seven seven continents by land sea and air Mm -hmm. and uh, I also do a little bit of um, business coaching uh, and uh, 
do some charity work as well. So that's uh, that's me in a nutshell. That's that's a that's a very very modest nutshell, and I'm I'm looking forward to to, to cracking it um, throughout the course of the show. Um, just quickly, how how much of your drive do you think was uh, predicated on that school report? Because you know how a lot of people really get a I'll show you type thing. It's not necessarily resentment. It's like, you know, this is really what I am capable of. Do you think it was your ambition is more biological, I suppose, or was it created by some of those circumstances? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, in part it was a uh, survival instinct. I mean, I realised, one does realise that, uh, you know, unless you're unless you're succeeding at school in some form or degree, you know that your prospects are probably, or at least that's the messaging. The, your, your prospects are not great. In fact, there was a something on the news only uh, here in the UK about um, some minister for government um, apprenticeships or something saying exactly the same. You know, 35, 40 years after you know I was at school. So mm-hmm. I think the messaging to kids is that uh, you know unless you get your grades. You're going to be a washout, a waste. You're going to be sweeping the streets with a broom, um, which is not everyone's ideal uh, job description. So I think there's an, an element of, of uh, panic that and pressure that people put on kids. Mm. And you know, my experience is that uh, some kids sadly will fold and they'll they'll implode and they'll get worse and th- things won't be great for them. Um, but then other kids, and I probably fit into the second category here, goes, you know, sod you, I, I'm, I'm going to do the best I can. I'm not going to give up. Um, I'll survive. I'll, I'll do the best grades I possibly can, but I'll hopefully I'll make it. And they'll yeah. have that inner confidence uh, and determination just to succeed or at least find what's uh, important, passion, um, and relevant for them for, for their lives. Mm. It's, it's a really, it's, it's a really interesting topic of discussion, I suppose, because, you know, that fuel can either be labeled as resentment or inspiration, you know, and I've always find that found that interesting how people can see it either one way or the other, you know, how, how hard is it that when someone gives us, you know, not only negative feedback, but perhaps even condescending, it's not even feedback. It was just, he's doing, you know, it's like, like, what do you go off that? You know, there's no solution focus there, but for you to, to, to see that or as kids, you know, to see that as, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to prove to you that I'm more than who you think I am as yeah. opposed to. I think that's ably de- demonstrated by the number of really, really successful entrepreneurs, adventurers mm. who are dyslexic. Yeah. Um, you know, Winston Churchill, um, Richard Branson, to name but a few who suffer from that terrible, you know, affliction of, of dyslexia at school, mm. um, where in my day in the 70s and 80s, you were basically classed as dim-witted mm. um, with, with, with this, you know, this problem, which was totally unfair. Um, but some of those, you know, people with, with, with that problem rose above and you know look at look at them now their their their, their cvs and their history amazing yeah. yeah it's it's great it's a it's a great way you know the perfect analogy is um the x-men series you know where dyslexia you know when when we are funneled through such a narrow frame you know to to go into the the the, the, the job market and become um factory workers and things the way this kind of society is set up you know these these inherent um you know, characteristics that we have can sometimes be deemed as weaknesses or whatever that is, you know, but unless we harness these skills, people who have dyslexia, well, now they're entrepreneurs because they can see things laterally. They can see things that none of us can see. And I think one of the greatest uh, assets, um, at least in my time now and our time as well is, is social media, you know, and when I um, graduated schools, 2011, it's just on the cusp of, of all this, but now there, there are so many kids who are, you know, artists, they're creatives and all they have to do really is set up an Instagram account and start taking photographs of their work and someone will see it out there, you know? So it's, it's, um, there are lots of things to like about this day and age. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, um, you know, the, the current trend for, uh, encouraging people to fail, um, and then only to learn and grow and then succeed uh, as a concept was, is very, you know, it was very alien to, to me, 35, 40 years ago, mm. but, you know, it's becoming more acceptable now. And I think, you know, uh, for you know, generally speaking, 
uh, people do grow when they set a, set a challenge and maybe you know fall fall a bit of a stumble, um, but get up and have another go. Um, you do learn from that, and you do grow, and you do develop, and uh, and that leads to new doors being opened and opportunities and successes. Mm, mm. Yeah. So so what compelled you to to join the Marines then? So because that's a that's not obviously someone that's not something that most people do. Well, um, my family history is steeped in, in military service. So there was um, a ge- genetic, uh, <laughs> you know, introduction, I suppose. Um, and closely, my all, my uncles, my grandparents all served. And, of course, they served in the Great War or the mm-hmm. Second World War. Um, what One or two were, were killed on D-Day and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So, you know, there, there was a, definitely a, a background of, of military service. And um, my dad actually was was a captain in the Royal Navy. Mm. And so it was very close to home, uh, mil- military service. I didn't want to particularly follow, uh, you know, a- anybody too closely. So I didn't want to uh, follow my dad into the, into the Navy. I didn't want to follow my grandparents into the Army. So um, I-, I thought Royal Marines. But actually it was, if I recall, it was a, a specific event when I was 12 years old. And Dad was uh, serving on a, a an aircraft carrier, commando aircraft carrier, and he was doing a, a three or four day uh, exercise in the Solent, which is uh, you know just off the south coast of, of the UK. Mm. And um, mm. like it wouldn't happen today, I, I promise you that. But in the day, my dad uh, managed to um, uh, fly one of the Royal Marine helicopters from the aircraft carrier. Uh, 35 minutes from Portsmouth to my school in Sussex, picked up me and two or three of my best mates, <laughs> and we spent three three days with the Royal Navy at, at, at um, you know during school time, wow. and um, were treated like you know an admiral would be treated on on the ship at, on exercise in the middle of the the ocean. It was incredible, um, but strangely, it wasn't the you know the fancy torpedo uh, team or the uh, you, you know, the, the officers on the bridge, um, you know, steering the ship and navigating and all that. Uh, it was the, the Royal Marine commandos who were uh, all camouflaged up with their, you know, with their rifles slung over their shoulders and um, disappearing off uh, in the helicopters yeah. for a mission ashore, whatever that, what they were going to do. And when they came back about, I remember six, six um, Wessex 5 helicopters were hovering 30, 40 feet above the moving ship as I was observing and ropes came out and these guys came abseiling out of the helicopters onto the deck and scuffled off into the, into the ship. I thought, Oh boy, yeah. that's what I've got. That's what I want to do. Yeah. And right there and then I, I was going to be a Royal Marine. Interesting. Cool. So, so you bait, you already knew what you were going to be doing after school was just go straight into that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, you know, with my academic record, it, it wasn't looking great as a as a prospect. I don't think anybody bar me thought that I'd ever achieve getting into the Marines, let alone, um, you know, getting a, a rare young officer um, spot, which was, you know, one in five thousand, uh, sorry, fifteen in five thousand entry level, yeah. um, particularly with my grades. But uh, you know that was my aspiration that was my vision that was my dream that became my passion to make that happen and you know when you have uh something so specific and so um clear defined uh, it, it it makes life a lot easier you know that's yeah. that's your goal and and everything is focused in towards that that's that that's probably another aspect um of the conversation that i that i wanted to 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 come to at you know at some point there, there's so much opportunity in this day and age um and that's such a great thing you know but we we, we really can drown in possibility and opportunity and um there, there's something that um bear grills wrote about in in the book where i first came across you so for everyone listening or watching guys um facing up is a brilliant book by bear grills and neil um is uh, heavily in in that book, and um, yeah, have you read the book, mate? Of course, I have. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that is my best mate. Oh he, right. He was he um so he was in um, the special forces regiment with me l- l- later on, and after I d- did the Marines, and then um, he came to me because I was organising. Well, I had just obviously been to Everest in '96. 
Um, and uh, a year later, um, when I was planning another trip back there, uh, he came knocking on my door uh, as a young 22-year-old um, with, a, with a dream to climb Everest. And um, he asked if, if uh, he could join my team. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, because I was just wondering if um, you'd read some of the little digs and things. I can't remember them too many, but he, his yeah. writing's very good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, don't worry. I, I I got him back a few times. Um, <laughs> good. There, there was one. Uh, there was one great occasion. He. I don't know if you know. He's got a beautiful uh, little island that he bought for not not an awful lot twenty years ago, and he's built a sort of a, a hideaway house. He quite. It's quite famous now. And um, so he, he disappears off to his island for, you know, six weeks of the year yeah. uh, to recharge his batteries. And um, so one day uh, I, I learned to fly a helicopter and um, I was doing some flying in the Welsh mountains. And I thought, oh, bears, bears new houses over here somewhere. So I flew across uh, the sea, found the island, found his house, and then it's got a flat roof. So I landed the helicopter, <laughs> uh, I went for a cup of tea, and then I took a photograph of this helicopter on top of his house and he went mad. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Sure. He didn't paint a big N on the top of it. <laughs> That's where you should be parking. Well, maybe you should write a book called facing down and just be all about the digs that, uh... <laughs> yeah. no, but um, yeah, no, you made a good point before mate about um, having a, a single minded focus. And that was something that, that Bear wrote about so heavily. Um, and I'm sure it would have been your experience as well. When you're climbing Everest, so when you're doing something, um, you know, massive like that. And I would say it's a lot of the stuff you would have done in the Marines would have really forge this, this mindset. But when there's only one thing ahead of you, obviously all your cards are on the table and that's the only thing you're doing, but it actually drowns out a lot of that um, existential anxiety, I suppose, that are really, that's really hurting a lot of young adults. And, and I would say late teenagers at this stage, because I don't know what I want to do and I can do this and I can do this. And Sometimes it's necessary um, to just be given a path, I suppose, because it's sometimes quite difficult to choose one because uh, you don't know which one's um, the best one. Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, I, I do think you're entirely right. And people, if they, you know, I was, I consider myself really lucky to have found that, uh, be given that experience of uh, that eureka moment of watching Marines abseil down a, down a yeah. road from a helicopter on a ship. And that, for me, was the spark. But I am fully aware that, you know, that probably is quite rare and very fortunate, and uh, and, and I appreciate that opportunity. Mm. Uh, I know there are a lot of kids, and I've spent, um, you know, most of my life on and off helping disadvantaged kids in one way or another, mostly by taking them on a, a adventures abroad. But uh, I realise that these kids and, uh, you know, some of them have their life stories are, are appalling. One young lady, I was um, on a, a trip crossing the Sinai Desert in Egypt, um, having an opportunity to sit down with her in the, in the, uh, under the you know, midday sun, just got to hear her life story. And her, her uncle had killed her grandmother with a, oh, with a hammer. Um, her dad was, her dad was in, in prison. Her mother had, um, had died age, she was tw eight or something. And she was put into her first care home at the age of uh, seven and a half or eight. And um, this backstory, uh, you know, just horrendous. And then, yeah. um, she, you know, admittedly, because of all of that, uh, she was a bit disruptive. And uh, she was sat there with me in the desert, age 21 or 22. She had been in 38 different care homes oh um, from, from that moment to when she was eight. Um there's no stability. There's no, you know, there's, it's just horrendous. And so I do appreciate that young people sometimes don't have that, um, that spark, that idea or that, um, you know, too many choices. But what I, I would say is this, try something, anything, mm, mm. Uh, give it your best shot. And then w w when you do that, other doors will open. And yeah. I think that's really important because there's nothing worse than just sitting on your backside um, moping around, feeling sorry for yourself, you know, get active, find something to do. It's impossible not to do something. Mm. And then other doors will open. Hopefully you'll be inspired or you'll learn something that will give you the key to, to trying something else. Yeah, that, it's so true. And, um, yeah, it, it is amazing how doors do open one out of the other and you sometimes don't know what you're doing, but eventually it's the door 13. It's like, oh, that's why I opened door two. Yeah, that makes That makes sense.
So, well, I want to want to move on because um, there's, so, there's so much I want to get through, Neil. Um, you, so you, you've you've done the Marines now on a piece of paper. Given that you are so interested in adventuring and climbing, it it looks like the way you built the company was a means to an end so that you could start climbing these mountains. Now I'm sure that's not the case, but um, did you, did you always have it in the back of your mind that you wanted to do these, these climbs? Yeah. So um, yeah, I was, I was coming out of um, full-time soldiering in the late eighties, early nineties. And um, I'd started my business career in a, a, around about sort of 1990, long time ago. <laughs> but um, I had always, you know, put adventure, travel, sport, and that's my passion, mm. uh, above pretty much everything else. Um, and, of course, in the military, I got quite a lot of that. So uh, whilst I was working in the military, I was getting uh, good doses of my passion, and so when I joined uh, Civvy Street, you know, with a pinstripe suit and nine to five regime, I was determined, uh, you know, not to give up on my passion and and, mm-hmm. um, and wanting to and, and have experiences. And so for the long and short of it, I set myself um, an adventure challenge called the Seven Summits, which uh, after a book by Dick Bass, um, where he coined the the phrase um the seven summits which was essentially uh, the highest mountain on each of the seven continents uh, which of course included everest and uh, mckinley and um unfortunately kosciuszko in australia but they they then some some of these <laughs> subsequently said well uh, the australasian continent does include indonesia uh, <laughs> and so um thankfully there was a slightly more difficult uh, mountain to climb in um in Punkat jaya in uh, Irin Jaya, Indonesia, um, but uh, the Seven Summits was was a, was a thing. And in 1991, Dick Bass, his guide, and um, Reinhold Messner, probably the finest mountaineer ever, uh, were the only three people who had done it. And so, mm-hmm. I, having read that book whilst halfway up a, a mountain in uh, uh, the Andes. I thought that's that's my challenge. Wow. Um, whilst I'm doing a, a business career, so I just did one one of these mountains uh, every year. And uh, just to let you know, when I set my own company up in 1994, October 94, uh, only about a year year and a bit later, I was off for an eight week expedition to Everest. And so that hopefully tells you that. Uh, it's really important to stick to your guns and dreams, mm-hmm. even though, uh, you know, I had committed to starting my own business. Uh, I was leaving it to the, to the, to the fore and fair winds. I did have a business partner um, who was very generous to fun. let me go. But yeah. I was disappearing two months, uh, a year and a bit after setting up my own business. Wow. Yeah. It's um, see, that's another great point as well, because I think we can get lost we can get lost if we don't keep that kind of vision, you know, it, uh, I mean, I try to keep mine written up. So I, so I never lose. Cause I think sometimes, you know, you wake up and then you start to compartmentalize and you think, Oh, well, well, this is going to help me with this. And, and this is going to help me with this. And all of a sudden two months down the track, you've, you've started to take a massive right turn. So I think, um, and, and what a perfect analogy, just climbing a mountain is, you know, getting to the top, you know, what, what is your definition of the top and, um, and how true can you say to that path? So, yeah, no, thank you for that, mate. That's a great point. So 1994, now the first time you go to Mount Everest is 1996. Um, can you, can you give us a bit of a background for people who don't know the story? Um, kind of what happened there in 1996. Um, and then like I asked you before the podcast, mate, I'd love to get to what compelled you, um, to go back in 1998 because that's just unbelievably brave in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, so um, 1996 was the first opportunity I got. Um, I was sort of partway through, I was you know, getting through the seven summits. I uh, had good amount of experience. I'd learned properly to climb in the Marines. I had good Alpine experience in the, in the New Zealand Alps, in uh, the European Alps, in the Highlands in Scotland. I climbed two or three of these bigger peaks in uh, South America, North America, and so forth. And so uh, whilst you know, I, I might have had a few uh, additional higher altitude 
peaks under my belt. An opportunity came, and I think that's another good lesson learned. You know, when an opportunity uh, presents itself and you, you feel intrinsically that, you know, the time is now, grab it, because it might not come back to you. So I took the opportunity. It was, it was not uh, ideal, you know, a year and a bit after setting up my own firm was not the best timing, but, you know, like you, like we say, it, it was important. So off I went, yeah. interestingly met um, uh, your first uh, and shared a tent um, with uh, your first uh, Australian slash Belgian uh, female Everest summiteer, Bridget Muir. Wow. And uh, she's a character. Um, but as you probably know from uh, films, books and, and articles, 96 season on Everest in the Nepal side was horrendous, um, fraught with difficulty, arguments, uh, teams imploding, exploding, uh, South African team particularly, uh, really difficult, um, led by a Brit, so I'm embarrassed to say, uh, <laughs> carnage. A lot of uh, acrimony, uh, difficulty, arguments. No, none of the team leaders could could agree on, uh, you know, a, a gentlemanly code of conduct and, you know, negotiating when everyone would get to, you know, the summit. And you have to, you have to collaborate because, mm. um, you know, you get a short weather window, um, and you know, a thousand people can't get on the summit at the same time. You have to negotiate and. Uh, and work with other team members and it was just a difficult uh year um mm. basically it, it, every everyone did what they wanted to do there was a bit of um argy bargy we think the americans had uh, a, a weather warning which said there was a storm coming but nobody really knew when and so basically it was business as usual everybody uh, went up the mountain uh 9th 10th 11th of may um, and of course, um, as aficionados of Everest will know, literally the worst storm in a hundred years hit the mountain on the 10th of May. And mm. at that moment, I was climbing from camp three to camp four, which is, uh, you know, the, the last camp before your summit bid. And of course, um, there was a number of teams, including Rob Halls and Scott Fisher's team, Americans who were um and japanese team that were coming down from the summit um in the worsening conditions uh, on that day 10th of may as i arrived at the south coal uh 5 30 6 o'clock in the evening um you know the wind was was hor horrific horrendous there were loads of tents around me i kind of I just assumed that everybody was was back safe down, which they should have been ordinarily um, in their tents. And, you know, you don't really interact. You just, you're exhausted. You climb into your tent. In fact, I had to erect a tent and which took 45 minutes instead of three minutes because wow. of the uh, the difficult conditions. But we dived in eventually. Um, we had a few missing cl climbers from my team. Uh, so my focus was was down the mountain, not up. And um, what transpired was that um, there were many, about 30 people still trying to get back to our location, which was probably why it was slightly quiet. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, during the night, it was horrific um, conditions. And sadly, you know, eight people lost their lives during, during that n next 24 hours. Mm -hmm. It was pretty grim. Yeah, it, it is a, it, it is an absolutely unbelievable story. And um it's one of those stories that that grips you in the same way that, you know, 9-11 grips you, you know, at least in my experience. Just hearing about individual experiences and and just how unlucky it is. And, you know, I certain when 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 9 11 happened, I was how how old was I? Eight years old, you know, so I was still young, very young. But uh, you know, in the years that followed becoming a teenager, I just I, I was watching and re-watching videos on YouTube because I just couldn't comprehend it. The same thing happened with Everest when I was, you know, when I first saw the movie and then um, jumped into Into Thin Air by John Krakow and and just just an unbelievable story that that grips you. So you 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 find yourself at Camp Four when the storm hits. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that evening, tenth of May. Uh, we endure, you know, a horrendous night in, in blizzard conditions, hur hurricane wind conditions. Um, uh, you know, it's touch and go for us. Um, but, of course, people left uh, caught uh, outside as they were and, and higher up the mountain, uh, you know, 
it was brutally brutally tough um, yeah. and that's why uh, a number of people didn't make it but some did and there were some incredible survival stories and um, Beck Weathers particularly I think um, extraordinary you know he was just 300 meters away on the eastern side of the the south coal it's quite a, a large plateau between the fourth highest mountain Lhotse and the um the, the steepening uh couloir and ridge of the southeast ridge of Everest leading to the summit so you're in this sort of um, plateau and uh, it's quite wide you know half a mile wide if you like and um you know, during in the, the following morning, daylight, um, I'm woken by uh, a chap called Anatoly Bukhreev, who, uh, in my mind, is a very brave um, uh, climber. And he was part of the Scott Fisher uh, team. And he'd been out trying to find his mates and, and colleagues and climbers uh, through the night. And we were completely unaware uh, of this was happening. Otherwise, we would have offered to help. Um, but we hunkered down survival mode and then um, he came to the, on my tent and, uh, you know, 6, 7.30, uh, 6.30 in the morning and, and said, you know, can you help? Just put my boots straight straight on, got out, started helping realise what was going on and, and missing people. Beck Weathers was 300 metres away and there was a man stood uh, 20 metres from my tent. He was the doctor for the American team. And I said, you know, I'm here, what can we do um, to help? And he said, um, well, there's, there's not, a, not an awful lot you can do. If you can get hold of base camp and, and tell them there's been a disaster because uh, the, the, the storm had, had cut out all the electrics and none of the radios worked. So I took it upon myself to, uh, to go and find a radio that worked. None of ours did. Um, and uh, extraordinarily, I went to, uh, again, it will appear in my book one day, but I went to a number of tents, including the South African tent, with the, um, the the difficult uh, personnel in there, and I say, can I please borrow your radio to to get hold of a base camp to, to help with a rescue effort? And the answer said, no, uh, we need it for our summit bid, and that's oh my quote. god, yeah. So not great. Uh, sometimes human uh, human nature gets the better of us, um, wow. and we don't see the big picture. I suppose, you know, if you're take, giving them the benefit of the doubt, they might have been slightly hypoxic, and, but I doubt it. Yeah. So anyway, that gives you a, a flavour of the characters that you're dealing with sometimes. Uh, so I left there in, um, in, in a hurry to go and find another solution. But when I came back and saw the American doctor, I said, what about, I said, sure, there's some people over there. He said, no, I've just been to see them. Uh, one's the Yazuka Namba, she's, sadly she's died. Um, and Beck Weathers, he's beyond help. That was his words. Jeez. And so, um, again, I spent some time focusing on other things, getting hold of base camp, organizing the, the rescue effort. And um, later that afternoon, so that was 7.30 in the morning, later that afternoon, Beck Weathers, having realized he'd been given up for dead, nobody was coming to get him, uh, kind of a light bulb, survival light bulb went off in his brain and he literally crawled 300 metres back into camp um, and within 30 metres of camp, somebody spotted him, dragged him into his tent and, and he made a recovery, lost his hands and nose and stuff to, to frostbite. But, um, you know, he's on the speaker circuit now and um, I'm, I'm sure pleased to be alive. It, it is one of the most fascinating stories. It's just unbelievable you know, that, that he actually survived. And, you know, the fact that um, came through on the, on, on the phone or the radio that, you know, they said we need it for our summit bid. Did, did that ever make you think about, because um, a lot of people talk about the commercialization of Everest and, and what was going on then, especially 1996 was, was indicative that um, you could pay a price and people were trying to get you up there. No, it's obviously not to speak ill of anyone, but um, did that make you think uh, differently about, kind of how, you know, Western uh, capitalism was seeing the Everest, was seeing the mountain? Because, um, I mean, Bear Grylls speaks often about in his book, um, I'm so pumped, mate, that you're, uh, you're going to be writing one. I'll, I'll hold you to that next time we do a podcast because <laughs> I want to read it. Um, but he, he often said in, in his book, um, you know, that it's, it's ultimately Everest that chooses who, who gets to the top, you know. So, um, yeah, did you ever think differently about the commercialization after that? Yeah, I mean, um, I think the, look, I was a, you know, 
posh boy from from England wanting to climb Everest. I, I'm in the category, but at least I'd done you know I'd done my apprenticeship. Yeah. I knew I, I was reasonably experienced. Um, I was 32 years old. Um, you know, uh, there were there are people who were on the mountain then that shouldn't have been on the mountain. Um, you know, yes, it was a, a one worst storm in a hundred years, but you know there were a number of people who died who could have, I'm sure, saved themselves had they just, you know, had a compass, you know, been able to navigate their own way back rather than rely on their guides. And so, in '96 and a few years before was the start of the big commercialization of Everest, and you know, since then it's just got a lot worse. I mean. Mm. Uh, you know, I've been back two or three times or more bef- uh, since. And, um, you know, a couple of things. One, uh, you know, just the the, the quality of the, the people, you know, you, you mentioned pay your money and, and go. I mean, that's pretty much it. It's sad. Mm. Um, but Everest has become a commercial um, entity, um, like it or, or, or not. Um, yeah. Yes, it, it, I'm the last person to, to stop people having a go. Um, but I but I do recommend that people uh, you know get their shit together and, and get some experience <laughs> on on higher mountains before going to Everest because you know when the shit hits the fan uh, it's every man for, and woman for him and herself mm. you can't rely on your guides and half of the death in 96, 96 was were, were the guides yeah. and so um, you do need to be able to self sufficient and have. Uh, your good experience the um yeah just one quick story you know when i um i went back a few years ago 2015 and then 2018 to a crack for charity uh the world's highest black tie dinner party and of course cool um you know i'm plying straight into the um the argument of commercialization of everest but we did raise about 100 and uh, 150 US, a thousand US dollars for, for for charities in Nepal. So I like to think it was worth it. Um, but just to give you an example of how things have changed and the ethics have changed for the people that's on it now, um, on the morning of our highest dinner party at the North Coal, the north side and the Chinese side, Tibetan side of the mountain. Um, as a good uh, mountaineer uh, as uh, one should be, you. You uh, go into your tent. You put your uh, boots and crampons and the you know the inner side, and you leave your ice axe uh, outside and uh, just outside the zip of your tent. So it's, it's you can grab it quickly when you if you're exiting. So I came out for the to for, to organise the highest dinner party in the world, and some asshole had nicked my flipping ice axe. <laughs> can you believe it? Oh, oh that sucks. So, some some foreign I won't name a country, but some foreign climber walking past my tent, realizing that he had forgotten his ice axe, oh. thought, well, "I'll nick somebody else's." Then, oh great, thanks yeah. a lot, mate. Tosser. Yeah, exactly. Jeez, that's crazy, isn't it? And we can't put that down to hypoxia, surely. It was just an asshole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I did. I, I wasn't going to rest. I was going to turn the camp over until I didn't. I had to descend the mountain without my ice axe, which wasn't easy. No. But um, uh, we did find the culprit, and um, I let my Sherpa team, uh, you know, organise the retrieve. Um, but I made sure that um, that he he was let known that um, yeah. one was unamused, as the Queen would say. <laughs> yeah, we can we can name and shame him in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I suppose what I was saying before was, you know, not not commercialization as such, but commercialization without that, you know, that real almost like a prerequisite to have done your training, as you said, because you you in the Marines and you'd done all this mountain climbing before, you were you were ready to go. It's um it's um one thing to sell a dream, I suppose, but also, you know, you can't help that because before I knew all this sort of stuff, um as a young kid, I'd be like, oh, that'd be cool to climb Mount Everest one day, you know, but the more you learn about it, the more conservative you become, you hear the facts, you know, one in four who climb Mount Everest, you know, end up dying as a result. And it's so. It's important. not that quite, it's not that bad. Um, oh, it's not that bad. The, the, the stats were for every six people that summited, this is back in the 90s, for every six people that summited, one statistically, one would die. Oh, right. But actually, nowadays, it's about one in 14. 
So okay. uh, experience, albeit the numbers are have far increased, and I think there is there's going to be another major disaster. Trust me, um, experience tells me that we've, if things don't improve in terms of numbers management, um, you know, another bad storm. Mm. Unexpected um, people, people trapped at eight thousand meters plus. There's going to be multiple, multiple deaths um, yeah. in one in one afternoon. Um, sad though that is, that's a reality. Unless the Chinese and the Nepalese governments uh, get themselves organised uh, and put some preventions and restrictions in place, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> hopefully that doesn't happen. But statistics say speak for themselves, don't they? Now. Two years later, you go back and you're actually successful and you summit Mount Everest. Can you just speak a little bit um, about your mindset in in that regard? Because, you know, lots of the guys and girls who listen to the show, well, first in trauma and and shock and and what that can do to the mind. Was there a grieving process? Did you need to go to therapy? Did you need to work through some stuff? Or were you just so inclined to get to this mountain? What, like, was that a hard decision to go back and... Um, yeah, if I'm honest, it was it was quite tough because obviously I had been through a fairly traumatic uh, experience mm-hmm. um, and had witnessed, you know, people around me, um, you know, good people uh, losing their lives, doing something which ultimately is 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 a fun project, and mm-hmm. there's nothing fun about um, you know thinking you're going to die for 48 hours. Um, and then watching others around you not make it, and Jeez. and you come through the process actually fairly, relatively unscathed. And yeah. so, yeah. yes, it was it was difficult. There was a lot of recrimination. There was a lot of um, soul searching as to you know what uh, you know one should have done or done differently. Um, you know, there's also guilt. Um, you know, particularly with. Uh, you know, I know he survived, but Beck Weathers, you know, I, I have guilt that I didn't go stop. Don't listen to that doctor. Um, go out and help the bloke. He was still alive. I have guilt that I didn't go and physically go and drag him into camp. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So yeah, there was, there was trauma. Um, but, uh, you know, I suppose if uh, I'm the sort of person who, uh, looks forward uh, rather than back. And, mm. um, for that, I'm internally blessed. You know, I know uh, others have a different mindset and uh, can't help it uh, to to dwell and to, uh, you know, go over in their minds the difficulties and the trauma and, uh, and, you you know, they can't end that cycle. But for me, it's always been relatively easy, um, whatever trauma, including losing both my parents uh, at a relatively young age, um, you know, just getting through it somehow. And that's, just getting on life has to life has to uh, get you know continue mm. and um also if you remember i had this sort of dream this passion it was stuff that i enjoyed doing and as you learned earlier i'm quite determined you know when yeah. when uh, obstacles difficulties and people put a uh, doubt in in your way and and don't believe in you then my default position is to go you know i'll prove myself and you wrong yes and uh and keep focused on on the mission and so yeah it was it it was an easy decision you know it was just a matter of time when um when would i uh go back and have another go at climbing this mountain it was Mm. part of the the aspiration the dream and the uh, and the the goals that i had set myself uh the the, those years before Mm. and so i suppose in a way Two years, not a huge amount of time, but it was short enough time to, to make 96 still uh, vivid in, in the imagination and the mind, but uh, long enough to to get over the immediacy of the, the trauma. And yeah. um, the great thing, I think, uh, that helped me was the fact that I got that mindset. I was lucky to have that forward-looking mindset, which definitely helps. But the other thing that I think really helps is just getting busy, keeping busy. So I had a lot of lot to do to prepare, not only, you know, carry on with normal life, but also to, uh, in my downtime, my spare time, your thinking time, I'd be, you know, I had to do all this planning and preparation and training and uh, organization and fundraising that kept me busy. And that, you know, mm-hmm. in, in essence helps you deal with, 
uh, those difficult um, thinking moments in the you know in the middle of the night, rather than uh, reliving the horrors, I'm I'm you know printing out plans and opportunities and um, who I'm going to try and get some money out of to uh, to help me realise my dream. Yeah. And the third and last thing I'll say is that. Um, leadership is a privilege um, and it comes with responsibilities, of course. But um, as I found in 96 um, th and, and again in 98 for various uh, different reasons, when, uh, you know, you're faced with uh, difficulty, danger, um, potential disaster, uh, if you're in a leadership position, you're privileged. You've got other things. You, you're thinking of others. You're serving. You're um, planning, preparing, uh, you know, scenario uh, building. So you've got things to do to occupy your brain and your mind um, and your being. And mm -hmm. so that really helps uh, deal with these sort of difficult, traumatic uh, scenarios and moments. Mm. Yeah, I think that's such a fantastic point. I, you know, we, we can think too much. This is something I used to say to my counseling clients that there is there's a really big wave at the moment, um, which I think is really cool um, in the social media world to, to look at our traumatic experiences and try to understand our subconscious attachment bonds, you know, where we learnt certain um, ideas about the world and about ourselves and our behaviours and, um, and really go back into the past to understand, which is, again, as I say, really brilliant. But there is also a trap there at the same time to get lost down the rabbit hole. And I think a lot of people have a hard time hearing uh, what you just said, um, which is keeping busy, you know, because they see that as, as, as a distraction or as an escape. But I, but I totally agree with you. I don't think it is. I think you can think too much and you can start to follow your own, your own tail and, um, and it's not going anywhere, but if you're forward focused and it's not necessarily something that needs to be inherent, um, it can be as much as having a, um, an intrinsically meaningful goal, you know, akin to, to, to one that you had and that, that, flips the switch from negativity to positivity, from pessimism to optimism. And all of a sudden you're, you're no longer looking as, you know, to bring it back Mount Everest as this, this terrible place of, of trauma, um, which it was of course, but also simultaneously is a place where, well, you know, you now know the route up to camp four, you know, you've, you've, you've done the acclimatization before, so you're well versed. So you can take a more of a leadership role um, when you're summoning with a friend. So, being that as it may, did you did you find that with that positive mindset, 1998 was um it was kind of like you almost felt like it was your year because you'd done you'd already been there. Yeah, no, that's there's some great points there, and and um, look, you know, whilst I might not be the person that goes to the the nearest shrink to to talk about my problems. I do appreciate that, that that's a great service. And maybe there's a compromise. Maybe uh, people should do a bit of that, uh, seek help and, and to delve and to, and, and to understand what's going on and to deal with um, you know, past trauma in that way. That's great. Mm. Um, but then you know, do that, but also do what we've just been discussing and, and get busy and focused and concentrate on the good things and the positive things um, that can come after after trauma mm. and, and life continuing, uh, you know, in, in a pleasant way. And for me, yeah, Everest is still, uh, whilst it, it was the scene of uh, some horrific uh, moments, actually it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, place. The people are extraordinary. The, the Nepali Sherpas are the most wonderful uh, people to spend time with which is why I keep going back. And, and of course, the place is, is stunning, you know, the geography of, of the Himalayas, of Everest, and, of course, then the, the, the challenge of, uh, you know, will, will you succeed in, your, uh, in this, you know, still difficult endeavour? Um, you know, it all leads to a, a really interesting dynamic. And, uh, you know, uh, for me, it was just a question of, uh, uh, you know, getting organised, getting prepared, trained, get the right... A new team on board, some sponsors, and yes, you're right. I had um, good, recent, relevant experience yeah. uh, to lead that team, which of course I think did indeed give us a head start. Um, not only we were a small, tight, uh, you know, team that knew each other, trusted each other. Um, we were all military at that stage, so we had mm -hmm. that sort of intrinsic bond, uh, trust. And we just got on with it. And yes, we had uh, obstacles. Bear fell into, uh, yeah. fell off one of the ladders in the in the ice fall and and cracked his arm, probably 
uh, fractured a, a bone in his elbow. Um, you know, uh, one of the summit bids um, with with Mick and um, yeah. Bear was actually yeah. this was a week before actual summit with Bear. I, I went up for um, with Jeffrey and Mick and two other members of my team uh, on the first summit bid. Um, sorry, just with Mick, uh, Bear and Jeffrey were uh, had contracted some sort of flu or chest infection, so they couldn't climb. They were stuck down in base camp frustratingly. So Mick, Mick and I went up, and unfortunately Mick got sick uh, at the South Summit. You know, eight thousand eight hundred and something meters high. Uh, it's about the the highest place that you can possibly uh, think about collapsing. And um, so I had a four day, uh, you know, epic getting him down from the South Summit, you know, a collapsed uh, colleague. So that was interesting and challenging. You know, we still had our, our moments and um, yeah. there, there was, success was not guaranteed. Anyway, we got Mick back down off the mountain, probably, um, you know, affected the, the, the world's highest ever uh, human rescue. Um, I got to base camp absolutely exhausted and, um, Bear and Jeffrey had both recovered from their chest infection, were desperate to go back up, you know, another bit of a weather window. And I was absolutely exhausted. Oh, oh my God. Um, <laughs> most of the Americans in camp, you know, heard about the story and come to, 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 to see me in from uh, the mountain. And um, it, to a man and woman, they said, Neil, nobody had ever climbed Everest or, or climbed to the South Summit. Um, and uh, let alone done a four day rescue of somebody from that height uh, and gone back up the next day. But that's exactly what I did. Oh yeah. It, it's a, it's amazing because you, you, you read about what, what you guys went through and, and even reading about the acclimatization is frustrating because I'm, I'm a reader. I'm sitting, you know, I'm sitting on a train, I'm, I'm out in the country, Victoria, and I'm like, God, just get to the fucking summit already. <laughs> but of course you have to go through the acclimatization, but for you to go back down oh, and then go back up is unbelievable. Yeah, so one of the, um, one of the interesting things about having uh, some relevant experiences, you get to, you try test and try different things. And um, one thing uh, that I'd learned uh, on my previous two attempts at the summit now was that uh, conditions always tended to deteriorate quite rapidly after, uh, you know, the one o'clock, which is why historically there's been a, an unwritten rule that uh, everybody climbing Everest on the summit day, they start, you know, they, they typically leave um, the camp Four South coal um, like 12, or one o'clock in the morning, climb halfway through the night, and then they're uh, hopefully 12 hours of climbing, they get to the summit around about midday, you know? And, um, but of course it's two or three hours minimum to get off the summit and back down off the, the, the dangerous sections and, and back down to, to, to the camp. And so that's when you're in the middle of this sort of rising wind and difficult conditions coming in. Yeah. So I thought, well, that's how everyone's been doing it for 50 odd years there must be a better way. I mean, you're climbing halfway through the night, leaving at mid midnight or one in the morning. Why not leave at nine or 10 in the evening, climb an extra two or three hours in darkness on the easy section going up the couloir, and then you've got the difficult section as it's becoming uh, light at dawn, first light at dawn, and then you're on the summit at seven, eight in the morning, and then yeah. you've got all all morning to get down at your, in your own time before the weather goes. So I just... I, I make that conscious decision um, probably somewhere between base camp and, and and camp three on the you know the third attempt with Bear and Jeffrey and not Mick um, the three of us and uh, of course put that plan into place um, and that's just that comes with experience mm, and mm. and just having the time to think is there a better way of doing this don't follow mm. the crowd don't don't be a sheep. Uh, think about your own, uh, you, what you're doing, and, and is there a better way to do something? And so yeah. we implemented that. We left at 9, 9.30 uh, in the evening, climbed through the night, uh, got to the balcony uh, uh, as dawn was breaking, up the ridge. Bear and I sat on the summit of Mount Everest at 7.30 in the morning. It's so good. Can you tell us what it was like? What What's the view? <laughs> Yeah, it was a bit uh, a bit misty and a bit cloudy. Um, 
there'd been a, a, an impressive electrical storm uh, over Makalu, fifth highest mountain in the world, um, 20 miles away, which uh, slightly concerned us. Um, oh, but yeah. cracked on um, the, you know, I've got, I've got uh, some, some nice pictures on the summit with uh, me and Bear taken with our, by our Sherpa. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's stunning. Uh, you can almost see the curvature of the earth, etc., and um, you can definitely see uh, the, the the smiles on our faces. So, from a from a um, you know from a a personal account, was it was it worth it? And obviously, that's a dumb question because it was definitely worth it. But like, what what was kind of going through your mind? at the at the top did you feel like um it was everything you thought it would be in more to exceed your expectations or can you take us through your, what was going on at the top well i think for me it was um a relief um you know i'd, I'd spent a blood sweat and tears getting there um obviously had a fair amount of trauma on on the on the road journey um so it was more, i think more of a relief and um my words over the radio to base camp were uh We've run out of earth. That's <laughs> right. Came- <laughs> that's right. That's good. Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> but, but I think Bear, he's probably, he probably more um, thankful to be alive uh, than anything else. And, and his famous words were, I'm not sure he put this in his book, oh, I just want to go home. Yeah, wow. That's crazy, isn't it? So, I think um, yours is yeah, a little, little more exciting. Different emotion. Yeah, totally, totally, and um, and obviously even just that final summit bid because you're passing Rob Hall's body from memory, and you know lots of things going through your mind as well. Yeah, you try and put some of those, um, you know, to one side as best you can. You you don't dwell on on difficult scenes like that when you're in a, a precarious moment, and of course, mm-hmm. as as your listeners will know. Uh, getting to the top of Everest is only a job half done. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, even even to us um, there at that moment, that joyful moment of reaching the summit and and seeing uh, you know the horizon out into the distance and knowing that you are the highest human beings on the planet at that very moment was pretty special. Yeah. But you also knew that you, you got a fair fair challenge to get back down again, and and of course the stats said that, um, you know, 70% of fatalities happened on the way down. Mm -hmm. So you still have to focus and you have to concentrate and you have to um, not lose uh, concentration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So (laughs) it's unbelievable. It's it's almost bittersweet, isn't it? Because you get to the top and you're like, yes, I've done it. But uh, you've got all that ahead of you as well. Now you get back down and, um, What's kind of going through your mind? What's what's the first meal you're looking forward to when you when you're able to get home? Um, I think uh, nothing better than a beer and a pizza. Actually, for me. <laughs> so true. Uh, and and of course, when you get uh, when you get to uh, Kathmandu, that's exactly what you can what you can get. Um, so it was it was it was lovely. And uh, unfortunately, I did get a little bit of frostbite. So um, there was oh, yeah. another. I, I can't remember if it's in the book, but. Um, Bear, this is this is a you know a typical uh, bear grills story. So uh, caringly, uh, you know, looking after his mate Neil, um, who got frostbitten feet, he arranges um, through the expedition manager uh, an emergency uh, on insurance helicopter to come in to base camp um, to to pick me up and, and send me back to you know, get me to hospital uh, to attend to my frostbitten feet. And um, when this helicopter arrives, um, the pilot slightly slightly bemused because um, there's there's a man dr- dressed and look looking very similar to Bear Grylls, who's got a, a, a made up sort of uh, armband, uh, red cross armband, and and um, Doctor Bear Grylls uh, <laughs> is escorting his 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 patient and best mate off off the mountain uh, quickly <laughs> to get to, uh, to Kathmandu for said. Beer and pizza. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing that he got um, that he was actually allowed on the helicopter. I couldn't believe that he managed to convince the two of them. But um, yeah, that's right because you you caught that frostbite. You were waiting at the very top for a long time. Was it a couple of hours? I can't remember exactly, but yeah. So um, with my 
ingenious plan to leave at nine in the uh, the, the the evening. Of course, the Sherpas, uh, wonderful people, um, maybe a communication error, but um, unfortunately they didn't follow us up, and they had all the spare rope and the supplies and right. stuff. And so um, we had to wait for two hours at the balcony, waiting for our Sherpa team to catch up. So in theory, the uh, we would have got to the summit even earlier. But um, uh, my, you know, my plan still worked. But the consequences were in waiting two hours, sat on your ass at eight thousand five hundred meters on Everest in the early hours. Um, I, ma- I managed to uh, get frostbitten feet, which which is unfortunate, uh, but not too bad. Um, you know, I, I still have my toes. So they recovered. And then part of the recovery was actually at camp two on the way back down. I got my boots and, and socks off. And uh, in, the, in the midday sun, it's actually quite warm uh, at camp two in the Kulwa, in the, um, the Western Coombe. Uh, and so I think I fell asleep for a couple of hours in the sun, um, you know, on, a, on, a, on, the, on the rocks. And um, I, I woke up and I got sort of frostbitten toes, but also kind of red, red feet. And so um, when I got back home to the UK, my, my mum uh, met me at Heathrow Airport and said, I hear you've got frostbite, darling. Um, right, we're going to Portsmouth General Hospital straight away. It's like 1st of July, midsummer, UK, <laughs> very hot day. Yeah. And we walk in A&E uh, Portsmouth um, and uh, kind of sheepishly say, I'm so sorry, could could possibly somebody uh, tend to my feet? I've got frostbite. And the, the nurse... <laughs> No content. Crazy guy. Uh, <laughs> no chance. I, go, go away. Stop wasting my time. And my mum goes, no, I'm, honestly, uh, he, he does have frostbite. So anyway, uh, eventually they believed me. I went around, you know, pulled a curtain. Uh, a doctor came to see me and we're like, really? What's going on here? And um, before I knew it, there was like tw- uh, 25 physicians surrounding, looking at my feet. And I said, what? It's only a mild case of frostbite. What's the problem? Am I, am I about to lose my, my toes or something? He said, no, um, I think you're the first person in history to have frostbite and uh, sunburn on the same part of the body. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> That's hilarious. That, that would have been a very weird thing to see um, in the middle of summer. That's hilarious. I didn't actually realise that frostbite, frostbite lasted that long So because it would have been days since you, how long did it take before it kind of went away or healed completely? Um, it took about a year for, oh, for the wow. frostbite to, um, to to recover the, all oh. the tissue to to, to regenerate. Um, you know, so I had like black toes, not mm. intensely black tips, black tips. So I'd caught it just in time. It wasn't as bad as it could have been. Uh, mm. Otherwise, I you you know dead tissue generally uh, you lose, and if it's all the way down, is it if it's it gets black pretty quickly if it's dead tissue. So you just the famous story of Ranulph Fiennes who um, got so bored of his uh, frostbitten uh, fingers that um, you know the slow process of uh, the uh, National Health Service. They weren't getting rid of uh, the black things, and it, you know it was just ugly and horrible. And he went down his garden shed and s- sawed them off with his hacksaw. Jeez, just had enough. <laughs> I can understand yeah. it. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Well, Neil, mate, I um honestly, I, I've I've got about a fifty <laughs> page list of questions in my mind that I'd, that I'd love to ask, but I'm I'm definitely aware of the time. Um. Mates, just just finally, um, is there anything else that we perhaps didn't touch on that you you know thought would it'd be worth some time? And I know you've got this very interesting world world record with a penny farthing bicycle. What's um that that's that's a little bit out of left field. What what's got your interest in those kind of bikes? So I'm I'm told there's a great uh, growing uh, scene for a revival of penny farthing riders in in um, Australia. In fact, all right, uh, either um, Victoria, I think it's Victoria. So um, yeah, I would encourage uh, every 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 listener to um, make an inquiry about penny farthing riding because it's super fun. Yeah, cool. Um, it's of course the big wheel and the small wheel bike invented in 1869. Lots of amazing historical records uh, for distance, speed, and uh, stunts. And um, you know, it's just a reviving kind of you know helped by I suppose myself forming the penny farthing club in the uk to encourage uh, enthusiastic community of modern day uh, victorian riders and we ride uh, whilst everyone's on these amazing carbon fiber 
racing bikes around town. Yeah. Um, you know, me and my gang, we're riding around sedately with uh, a 54-inch wheeled bicycle with a top <laughs> hat on. Yeah. Um, Look at the just puts a smile on everyone's faces. And we have a lovely time. We do, um, we race, we play polo, and uh, we do charity rides and events and endurance rides and so forth. And, um, uh, you know, we get we get people involved and uh, teach them how to ride and, and all that kind of stuff. And my um, claim to fame, even at the age of 50-something, uh, <laughs> um, I managed to set three Guinness World Records uh, two years ago um, when I, I discovered that uh, there were no... Uh, records for riding a penny farthing without using your hands. Wow. Which, which is quite difficult, I yeah. have to admit, and definitely not for the novices. But uh, after five or six years of uh, practice, I managed to master the technique of riding uh, this Victorian bicycle eight foot off the ground um, with without using hands. It's quite tricky, but possible. And, um, yeah, I did three Guinness World Records for speed, uh, 10 kilometres and the furthest distance in one hour, Without uh, around a track, without uh, touching the handlebars. And so, well, obviously, Neil. Now the the next step is to get you to ride a pen and filing up and down Mount Everest. So obviously, you, you're in training for that one. <laughs> no, but funnily enough, I do have a, a, a an expedition that will go to the Himalayas as soon as we're allowed to travel. Oh yeah, um, which will be the highest bike ride in the world. So uh, yeah, I, I I'm actually doing that as a thing. It won't be on Everest. Because uh, um, for the reasons that we've discussed, I think um, it's got enough commercialization. And the other thing is there are eight, uh, one million and eight mountains registered in the world. Um, it's not all about Everest, yeah. even though I've been there six times. Uh, you know, there are plenty of, of beautiful mountains other than Everest mm. that people should consider uh, climbing. And um, most of them are still unclimbed. So... Um, and the great benefit there is you get to, if you're the first to climb it, you get to name it. And I've named a few. Um, cool. so we're going to the, uh, the, one of the, the, the high, the, one of the highest 100 mountains in Nepal, um, uh, we'll be taking mountain bikes and attempting the world's highest mountain bike ride. Oh, that's charity. so cool. Yeah. And, and such a great point that you made as well about it not being, um, all about Everest as well. I think, um, I think that's a really fantastic point. And, um, yeah, I didn't realize there were so many mountains out there. Um, that's, that's quite amazing. I, it's definitely got me a little bit more interested in doing some climbing myself now. I probably won't ever make it to Everest. Um, I'm happy to read your book when it comes out and hear about it even more, but, um, doing a bit of climbing might, might, might do me some good. Good for you, Tom. <laughs> Mate, thank you so much for coming on the show. As I said in the, in the very beginning, it was, um, I haven't really looked, looked forward to a podcast like this in a very long time um, with deep respect to all my other guests, but just a, an incredible life story. You have in so many lessons there that we can take, you know, not only from having a goal that's really intrinsically meaningful and, and that almost, you know, engendering a meaning for you in that time, um, being solution focused as well and, and, um, and getting back on the high horse, despite the suffering I think is, is really, really powerful. So thank you so much for those lessons. Uh, pleasure. Good to talk to you. Fantastic guys. Thank you so much for listening and uh, I'll speak to you next week. Bye.